Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's event, Future Proofing Next Gen 911, How to Overcome Challenges and Achieve Excess. My name is Morgan Wright. I'm a senior fellow here at the Center for Digital Government. This is going to be a lot of fun. I've been involved with this kind of technology for a lot of years, and I'm excited for you guys to learn what I discovered during our previous time that I've been working with the team. So before we begin, just a couple of brief housekeeping notes. A recording of this presentation will be made available to everybody within 48 hours. Use this for your own use or feel free to pass it along to the people who weren't lucky enough to be here live on the call today. This webcast is interactive and you can participate in the Q&A with us by asking questions at any time. Just hit that Q&A button down at the bottom. We're going to do things a little bit differently this time. We're not going to save Q&A for the end. We're going to ask that you get your questions in during the main segments that I'm going to introduce to you here in just a little bit. Now, at the conclusion of the Q&A, if you want to download a, uh, or at the webinar, if you want to download a PDF of the slides, again, just click Webinar Resources widget down at the bottom, and you can download those copies for your future use. Also, during today, webinar. You'll be able to connect with everybody over LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. Just use the hashtag GovTechLive to connect with all of your peers across government technology platform over Twitter, LinkedIn, any your social media platform of choice. Now, at the close of this webinar, we want you to complete just a brief survey. We've made dramatic improvements. We've changed the type of topics and our formats because of the input you all have given us. So we want to hear what you think. If you can't stay with us for the entire webinar but want to complete the survey, click on the survey widget again down at the bottom. It'll launch it. Just fill that out uh, before you leave us once the webinar concludes. Now, right now, we recommend you disable your pop-up blockers. And if you're experiencing any media player issues or any problems at all, we've got a help cast guide. Just click help down at the bottom. We've also got Chris, our crack staff from On24 here available to help you with any technical issues. Now, joining me today to discuss this, I've got two experts with me. I've got James Carlson. He is the public safety solutions leader for Lumen. And I've got Steve Deloach. He is the sales engineer for Lumen. Now, before we get to these two experts, I've just got a couple of slides I want to throw out to you and just kind of let you know what's going on. First of all, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the evolution of connectivity, just a couple of slides to explain how far we've come. Then we're going to get opening remarks from Jim and from Steve. They're kind of give their state of the state, what they think is going on. Then we're going to get into our panel discussion. We've got four things we're going to talk about. The platform story, designing a platform, the power of the platform, and then we've got a really interesting case study at the end. What we're going to do is integrate the Q&A. So as we talk about, for example, the platform story, if you have any questions during that segment, get your questions in. I'm going to ask them during that segment. We want to do as much real-time Q&A as we can for this. So let's kick things off. So if anybody looks at this diagram and you wonder what the heck is it, it looks like it was written on the back of a napkin. This was the original design for the internet. This was ARPANET back from 1969. It originally connected four places. That was the start of the internet. I don't think anybody had an idea how much we would grow and how much we would grow to rely upon the power of the internet, the power of advanced technology to do so many of the things that we do today. So how much we grown, what does it look like? Well, that is actually a mapping of the internet, you know, as much as you can condense it down. That's what it looks like. We've gone from four small nodes to uncountable number of nodes, things we have everything that's connected today. IoT, Internet of Things, smart devices. We've got cars that are connected. We've got refrigerators that are connected. Anything with an IP address can be connected to the internet, but anything with an IP address can also be vulnerable. So that's part of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how do you design a next-gen 911 platform? What's the elements for success? What are the things you should be thinking of? And we've got a couple experts to do that with us. So the first one we have is Jim Carlson. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Jim. Jim's career with Lumen has spanned 32 years. He's held roles in IT, finance, billing, product management, product development, marketing sales, and business development. Full breadth of activity. He has led initiatives to bring new technologies to market, rationalize Lumen's product portfolio, and their entry into the web world. He currently works with the Lumen sales teams across the country, working with them to help describe the power of their public safety portfolio and the solutions to their customers. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to turn it over to Jim. Jim, you've got the floor here. You get to give your state of the state, then we'll go to Steve, and then we're going to kick off this webinar. So Jim, the floor is yours. Thanks, Morgan, and uh, hello to everybody, and thank you for joining us this uh, afternoon. You know, I, I have to begin with just kind of 
being transparent and saying how, uh, you know, what a an honor it is to be a part of this industry, public safety. When you get to tell people that you work with folks whose their, their purpose is to save lives, I think that's uh, e enormously gratifying and, and just an honor to spend time with you all. Uh, you know, uh, this is really an exciting time, and, and I'm a technology guy at heart, and so when I look at what's going on, you know, it's easy for me to get excited and see the possibilities of where the technology is taking us all in, in public safety. Uh, but I think it's important maybe to pause, because we're going to talk about the future, but I think it's important to pause for just a moment and say, let's kind of take stock of what's going on around us. First, there's just an awful lot of change going on. I mean, new technology, new standards, new applications being created almost uh, on a weekly basis by really inventive, smart people. And it's really exciting. And we've uh, Morgan's already shared with us all this data that's out there, whether it's IoT data uh, and data that has so much promise to help in the emergency response. And some of that data is already available to public safety answer points, and that's exciting, but, but there's more to come. Uh, th there's more to come, and so how everything integrates together, all this data, all these new applications is gonna be really important, how data comes in, how it gets handed off between applications, and, and how the workflow happens in a public safety answer point is, is really Im important for speed and efficiency and accuracy. And and so so here we sit in the, in the midst of all this change and complexity with a, an emerging sense of where all this is going. And there's a lot of unknown. And so, uh, you know, what we can see is there are certain decisions that are getting made right now that are, that are pretty clear, like upgrading to a new CAD system or a new call handling system. But there's a lot of unknown because that future that we we're, we're looking at is evolving as we speak. And so today what Steve and I are gonna talk about is the, the platform. This notion of a platform and how it links the applications together, how it links the whole experience together and the term that we use at Lumen, uh, platform thinking. And, and why platform thinking for us? Well, we're a platform company, that's what we do, we connect. And that platform, and this is what's really exciting to me, the platform is the infrastructure that hooks all the applications together, whether they're in your back office or whether they're in the public cloud. It's that platform that is the, the, the way data comes in and, and how it gets integrated with all the data that's already there and how it moves from one place to another. And, and it's that platform that everything sits on. And so that platform sets the stage for everything. And, and so we're gonna talk today about this notion again of platform thinking and, and how that can help you future-proof your, your, your plan forward uh, in, in this environment where the, the future is evolving and, and it isn't always crystal clear to us. And, and so what we want to uh, share with you this morning, some things to think about. So platform thinking as a way of paying attention to the whole picture. So, so obviously the applications are really important in a public safety answer point in the whole public safety experience. The applications are important because they drive the experience, but, but there's more to the story than that. There's the, the platform that connects all the elements together. Uh, platform thinking also recognizes that all platforms are not created the same and, and special care needs to be taken to what it means to be public safety grade. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about this in our, our example at the end of our time together. This is really important for reliability and performance and, and security. Uh, and also it's platform thinking that gets you ready for the future. And, and so with this platform in place that, that you construct that is future proof, then, then as you make decisions in the future about whether to take applications off the cloud or, or whether you need to ingest new new data and where would it go and how are you gonna handle it? That, that um, platform approach is gonna position you for the future and so that's what Steve and I are gonna talk a little bit about today. And, and so just to kind of wrap up my intro, uh, this is really an exciting time for all of us. There's so much potential out there ahead of us to, to leverage technology to save more lives, to to increase the safety of first responders, to, to save property, to, to really make a meaningful impact, a continued meaningful impact in the lives of, of uh, our communities around us. And so what an exciting time for us all to be joined together to, to benefit our communities. And so thanks a lot. And Morgan, back to you. There we go. Almost had it, almost got the mute button uh, figured out. 
Um, hey, thanks, Jim. No, look, dude, this is a topic near and dear to my heart. I was a state trooper, a, a detective for 18 years. My wife actually worked 911 dispatch. I can tell you, uh, just like a lot of people can, how much my safety, my life depended upon having an effective 911 call center. So I think you just hit that spot on. So let me introduce to you our next expert. Now, our next expert, he's also a fun guy, too. This guy has been working on technology for so long. When we started talking, we had a little laugh about CDPD, and those of you folks who were around for CDPD understand how painful that might have been for you. But Steve is the sales engineer with Lumen Technology. He's a native of North Carolina and has over 30 years of telecommunications experience. He started his career with a local telephone company called Carolina Telephone and Telegraph, headquartered in Tarboro. He served in many roles within the industry from computer programmer, wireless mobile broadband engineering manager to designing and implement e E911 and now next gen 911 solutions. He served the public safety community for over 20 years. He's engineered and assisted with implementation of the first E911 call handling system for a public safety agency uh, within the Carolina Telephone and Telegraph Company footprint. He's also spent six years engineering and designing wireless broadband solutions for public safety agencies. This is where we're talking about CDPD was so slow you could see the ones and zeros coming across your screen. So we've advanced a long way from CDPD. He's also been on the North Carolina 911 board prior to joining Lumen, and he currently provides public safety engineering support for several states. So Steve, I think this is gonna be a fun time. So the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Morgan. I appreciate that yeah, great intro. <clears throat> First of all, good afternoon, good morning for those. So before we get started, I just wanna kind of take everybody back a step to kind of lay out how we got from our legacy systems to this whole notion of next generation. In the E911 world, the architecture was simple, but yet very complicated. And it was complicated due to the many silos. Every component was in his, was in his own individual silo. The network team, they only managed the network, the camera trunks, the database circuits, the selector routers. The database team, they only managed the Alley database and provided input for the MSAC for the selected routers. The NOC, they only monitored the network and they had limited visibility into the CP equipment. And then you got the, the last or uh, first line of defense, which was your CP technicians. They only maintained the 911 CPE equipment and normally the last mile for the network for the anti Alley circuits. So this design was very complicated and very time consuming to add or implement any new services or solutions. You know, for example, a lot of you guys can relate to this. Um, when we first started implementing wireless phase one and phase two, which really sounded really simple, just getting the address information for the, the sales site sector and then later the XY coordinates, it took years to implement something as simple as getting wireless any alley information and you add on to that god forbid you try to transfer a 911 call from one piece up being served by selector router a to another piece up served by selector router b and those routers were not interconnected so you can see the the overall components were very simple but due to the many silos it were very complicated to operate in that environment So as we move to the platform of amazing things, and I'm calling this the next gen 911 ecosystem. If you look at this slide, there's a lot of components that's a part of the ecosystem. So it seems kind of complicated and busy from a slide perspective. But the beauty is the next gen 911 architecture, although it's complex, yet it's very simple. And we think the platform provider is the glue to future proofing your next gen 911 capabilities. Traditional silos in this new ecosystem is non existent. The migration from an analog to IP based solution design has afforded public safety agencies to be able to keep up with the Joneses. I mean, in our world, the traditional enterprise customers, they were kind of always on the leading edge of technology. And they've always, they always had the latest and greatest of everything. And the good old public safety customers, although we provided that critical support and critical service, we kind of always got, was the last to deploy any type of technology. 
as approved solutions have the need to interface to our public safety platform, we now have the infrastructure to support it without taking years to implement any new solutions with also keeping security as the number one priority. So I just want to kind of talk about what I'm going to, what I'm calling the four main pillars of this whole future proof in our next year now on one solution. The first piece of the network or the ESINET, you know, from the ecosystem slide previously, the ESINET platform is the centerpiece for future proofing your next year number one investment. With the ESINET comes scalability, cost effectiveness, and resiliency, which are keys to future proofing your investment. Increased bandwidth capabilities, less unplanned downtime or outages, as we commonly call them in the industry, leaves more time for the deployment of new solutions and services to provide better 911 services to your citizens. The call handling piece of, of this, and, and I'm calling that, that's a piece of, from a future perspective, the edge cloud. With all the benefits of an IP network platform, the call handling equipment is still a critical component to the future next year 911. Whether in the cloud or on the customer prem, your platform provider should have robust knowledge of its role in the next year 911 ecosystem. Once an agency determines that they are ready to work with their platform provider to migrate to the cloud, there will be instant benefits gain, more efficient use of local resources, no longer is the PCAP having to manage that backroom CPE controller. Faster implementation of hardware, software changes, and faster deployment of new solutions. The next pillar in this next gen I want ecosystem is I'm going to call it the NOC SOC. The NOC SOC becomes a another critical component to ensuring that the platform provider solution is exceeding the five nines of reliability that's required for monitoring and security of the network components 24 by seven by 365. So in this new world that we are kind of, kind of migrating over to from an IP perspective, where analog, you kept the bad guys out because there was no way to get into that copper network as we migrate over to a IP platform, the NOC SOC and security becomes a critical component to the future proof and future proof of your next year 911 solution. And finally, uh, collaboration is robust to the next year 911 platform. And at the end of the day, this is the end game. You know, we're trying to build a platform that improves responses to 911 calls for service, it enhances the 911 center employee productivity, and also it provides long-term operational savings for the platform. Back to you, Morgan. Hey guys, as you can see, we're teeing this up for some great fun. So now what we're gonna do is a panel discussion. There are four topic areas, two points of view that I wanna get the discussion going. We've already got some questions coming in, so hit your Q&A button down at the bottom. We're gonna allocate about 10 minutes to each section, and that'll bring us right up uh, to the top of the hour. So we wanna make sure that we reserve enough time in case there's any additional things that come in. But let's do this. Let's kick off with the first one. And this is the platform is the foundation. And I know, Jim, when you and I talked, this was an area obviously of passion for you. You've got some new ideas and platform to you has actually has a specific meaning. So let's talk about this for a little bit because I can tell you having been around for a long time like you, like Steve, we've seen a rapid change of technology and the way that people invest. So why is a platform like the best way to future proof your investments? Yeah, I think that's, yeah, a, think that's you know, a, it really is. It really is a great question. And I think it's great because of the environment that we're in. So, so part of that is the, the, the platform that gets deployed for next generation 911 is the platform that the services are delivered across. And, and those services are all about saving people's lives. So the, the performance of it, the, res, the resilience of it is so very, very important. But also the, 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 the context that we live in is one where the future is evolving. 
And, and, and so the, the kind of platform that is deployed either sets you up to, to be ready for the future, even as the future is evolving, or, or limits you uh, by the, the various definitions of the platform. And so, so, so as we look at the future and, and we see this uh, evolutionary uh, nature of it, um, we, we, we recognize that it, it's like building a house. So, so when you sit down to build a house, you're gonna talk about rooms and how the house is gonna be used. But at the end, you're gonna have a foundation that's built. And that foundation needs to be stable. And, and it really defines in many ways how the house will get used over time. And so the, the same, I think, principle uh, applies here. So how do we protect the future? You know, how, how, how do we think into the future where that future is, is evolving, where as we've already touched upon, there's gonna be so much more data that's out there. And the way people is communicating, uh, people are communicating is changing and evolving. And we're already seeing machines communicating to public safety answer points saying when there is uh, help needed. We see uh, applications that are gonna need data, applications in the cloud, and then really exciting advancements in artificial intelligence and in machine learning and, and, and enabling applications to harness all that data. And, and so, so, so in, this, in this world where the near term is pretty clear and the longer term is a little fuzzy, it's, it's kind of taking form mm -hmm. over time, then it really becomes important to ask the right questions. And, and that's really, really important. And, and I just wanna say that I think the better we all are at asking questions, the clearer the future will be to us and the better the foundations will be that get built to carry the solutions that we want and we're gonna need for the future uh, of public safety. And, and so what are some of the questions that really need to be wrestled with? Well, where is the data gonna come from? You know, we all know in kind of a general sense, there's IOT data and, and city cameras and, and various inputs, but specific to your geography, to where you are, your state, your county, where is the data gonna come from? And how's the data gonna get from wherever it sits now to wherever it needs to, to go? Well, what's the path for that? And is that path gonna be uh, resilient enough and secure enough and reliable enough? And, and how will that data be used? How will it be processed? What applications will use it? And when do they need it? And where does it need to sit? And how are you gonna manage the data? How are you going to back up and do disaster recovery and, and all those elements of data management that are going to become more and more important as, as we move forward? And, and will possibly will some of your data sit in the cloud? And how might that interact with data that sits in your back room? And, and how does all that work together? And, and so I, I think as we think about the platform and, and we think about the sturdiness of that platform, that's going to be essential but also the questions and the conversations that we have that lead up to the deployment of platforms is gonna be just as essential. And the better we are at asking and answering questions, the more robust conversations we have, the better the future will be. Yeah, I think you nailed it too. Um, I remember a quote from Albert Einstein. He basically said, if I had one hour to live in my life depended upon answering you know, a question, I would spend the first 55 minutes thinking of the right question to answer and then five minutes you know, solving the problem. So I, I think you've just hit upon it uh, spot on. Let me let me follow up with that a little bit because uh, we actually have kind of a follow on question from Willie Foster uh, with the California State. I can't quite read it. Uh, something department, but it goes into this next one from COVID to natural disasters. Look, we are facing increasingly complex situations um, and unique challenges in responding. So, uh, and I can tell you when I first started, I date myself. I had a Smith and Wesson 686, a pair of ammo dumps and handcuffs. That was the extent of technology, not even a handheld radio. We've come so far. So how does a platform enable a quicker, faster, more effective responses? And, you know, at the end of the day, it's, you know, we're obviously keeping people safer. So how does the platform start enabling all of those things and everything you talked about, bringing it all together? Yeah, that, that's a really great question. And how wonderfully timely it is with, you know, what we've experienced as a country, what we've experienced as a whole world over the last seven months, and how the, the presence of, of COVID-19 has shocked us all and, and disrupted what we knew at the time as normal and caused 
professionals across the country, across all industries, public safety as well as the commercial education government has caused us all to have to respond quickly. And, and I, 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 um, you know, I want to emphasize that quickly. It's really quite amazing as I've had a chance to listen in and hear from public safety professionals across the country and what their immediate responses were to, to having to set up special work areas in their center or have some of their employees work from home, how, how they were going to deal with screening and having outsiders come into the centers and do work and, and, and how they moved so quickly to respond to the situations that they were in, how they continue to work quickly. And, and so I think the thing that we want to remember is first, that the flexibility and adaptability has to be built in. If it's not already there, so if we took COVID-19 aside and, and said, you know, let, let's not have this conversation just looking at COVID-19, we could say that the, um, the platform itself has to already have that adaptability in it before the COVID-19 examples show up. And so I think it's important for us as, as platforms are built, as NextGen 911 solutions are deployed, as other solutions for public safety are deployed, that we think about what does flexibility and adaptability really mean in the platform. So I think it can mean several things. It, it, it can mean an ability to have a workforce that can be geographically independent of wherever the application sit. So if the applications like call handling or CAD are delivered uh, from a, a managed, from a private data center or a public uh, uh, data center or, a, the or the cloud, as the application sits somewhere other than where the, the humans are, then the humans aren't geographically linked to those applications. And so there's flexibility already built in in terms of mobility. I think when things like COVID-19 happen, then new applications get developed like right away. It's really quite incredible to see the software community across the spectrum invent new applications that are making lives better because of this pandemic. And so as those applications are being developed, it's important that the platform can quickly adapt to those applications, that new applications can be introduced in a secure way and, and quickly leveraged by the, um, the, the people who need to use them to respond to the situation. And so I think there's lots of characteristics that need to be paid attention to as it relates to the platform. Characteristics like how, how quick can you add more bandwidth if you need more bandwidth? So how quickly can you scale up? How quickly can you respond to security threats? And, and how well is the monitoring of the platform taking place to keep things secure? How quickly and how flexible is the platform to ingest new sources of data? It's, it's like those new sources of data seem to be popping up all, all the time. And, and how quickly can the platform adapt to the evolution of your communities? Because this isn't just a technology question here we're asking. It's a people question. It's communities who communicate, who work together, who are trying to take care of themselves and their families. And how adaptive is the platform to enable that and respond to new situations? Look, um, again, you're just kind of knocking it out of the park. It's just when you go back and you think about designing all this stuff, I just think about COVID-19 and a webinar I did with the chief digital officer of Oklahoma. He said projects that used to take two years and $10 million are now being done in about a week. To your point, we have to figure out how to adapt. Right. So look, this is a great way to conclude this part of it because we want to go now that we've talked about the what, what is the platform, then we've got to start talking about designing the platform. And Steve, this is where I'm going to call upon you. I've got an initial question, but I want to follow up with the question about data on this. So when we talk about designing a public safety platform, what are the top considerations? What are the things that should be at the forefront, you know, at the top of our mind as we think about designing a public safety platform? Hey, thank you for the question, Morgan. So, so for those that know me, I'm, I'm one of those guys that like to really keep things simple because I've been in lots and lots of meetings where you're starting to kick off consideration for a next year number one platform and you leave that meeting scratching your head saying, what have I gotten myself into? And more importantly, I only got three years left to retire. So I think the, the most important component 
from a platform design perspective is making sure that you select the right platform partner. And the reason I say this is a lot of the behind the scenes technical design stuff is going to be way above what we've traditionally dealt with as related to camera trunks, where the selected routers are located, and how I get data into the MSAG. So you're going to rely on your platform partner's expertise in all aspects of your next year number one, from network to applications, as well as interactions with OSPs, originating service providers, wireless providers, uh, the Internet of Things, the IoT, as well as OTT or third-party application providers such as Rapid SOS. And more importantly, you got to make sure locally that you assemble the right team to identify current and future requirements. And I know sometimes this could be overwhelming. You know, the dispatch center may say, hey, you know, right now we've got our hands full just addressing and meeting the needs of our customers, the, the individuals dialing 911. We're not going to have time to get knee deep into this new technology. And once again, that's where your public safety platform or solutions partner becomes critical. And I think the second piece to that is make sure that your platform partner has the years of experience in the industry because we're seeing, because there's a lots of money being thrown at next year 911, there's a lot of vendors popping up with software solutions and next gen core services that don't have a lot of experience in the industry. And a lot of them can't even, probably can't tell you what a camera trunk is or what a selective router is or how do you go about interfacing with the OSPs. So I think it's really critical that you pick the right platform partner, but more importantly, they got the years of experience in the industry. Because remember that your platform partner is gonna probably be your trusted advisor for the next five to 10 years. Now you're gonna rely on your, your platform provider partner for guidance of any changes that you need to make to your next gen 911 technology platform. Well, Steve, you know, let's expand that a little bit too, because as we talk about designing and building this, we've got now that, uh, again, what I talked about, we've got types of data that are being brought into the PSAP that we never even contemplated 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when some of these were designed. We're thinking about the multiple camera feeds. We're thinking about potentially, you gotta be careful to anything you bring into the PSAP, like social media, text to 911, you know, all of these different things like this, right? So with so many sources of data, what are the most important factors then from that point to consider in the design? Because some infrastructures or some solutions may not be ready to adopt and bring in a current solution, right? So is there some upgrades that need to be done as well as implementing the platform? Give me some thoughts around that. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Morgan. Great question. So, so I've got kind of three pillars here for the platform design as far as all this new data coming in from a lot of different sources. And I think the most critical piece to that is the platform scalability. So this is going to be critical to meet in future bandwidth requirements of the current needs and also of the future. And then the second piece of that is platform resiliency. I mean, we throw that term resiliency around a lot and you know, what does it really mean? So at the end of the day, here's what it means in my mind. Uptime is the number one measurement in 911. When I dial 911, did the call get through to the agency and was it answered? So from a resiliency perspective, you gotta make sure that every time that end user dials 911, you've got an infrastructure in place to make sure that call gets delivered, gets answered, and gets acted upon. And I think that the third pillar to this piece is security. I know Jim mentioned and talked a little bit about security up front, but we got to make sure that as we migrate from a copper environment, where it was really hard for the bad guys to get in and we're migrating to an IP platform, that we got to make sure that we can keep the bad guys out. And as I mentioned earlier, with all this data coming in, you got to make sure that your platform provider or partner that you select is aware of what's going on in the industry and is making sure they're keeping you up to speed and up and abreast of what's going on. 
So let's talk about that. Once you start designing things, you know, and we start, we, you know, and so many, to your talk about everything's changing, companies are changing. Companies that traditionally made hardware are now having to make software because the hardware is going away. It's all being done by software, software defined networking. So how does an agency take a look at this and properly balance their software and their hardware requirements? Because again, they're spending taxpayer money. We want to, you know, we want to be good stewards of the public money, but at the same time, we've got to spend effectively. You know, you can't lift a rocket off that's ten percent fueled. You can only lift a rocket off if it's fully fueled. How do we be that efficient as we think about hardware and software? Yeah, it's a great question, Morgan. And, and once again, I'm going to go back to my keep it simple method: plan now for the future. I mean, it's really that simple. And the other component to that is the cloud is coming. No matter what we think, you know, we, we really like to see those lights flashing in the back room. But there's going to be a point in time because the technology is changing so fast that there's got to be a decision made to start truly evaluating migrating to the cloud. The second piece to it is cheaper is not always better. And I know a lot of times during this next gen technology upgrade process, there's an RFP process involved and there's different requirements for different states. But just keep in mind that cheaper is not always better. And there's an old saying, you're going to pay now or pay later. And I think the final piece of this is, you know, for the agencies and their partner, they need to stay engaged and involved with, with what's going on at NINA. You know, NINA's constantly developing new standards, evaluating new applications, and also making sure that PSAPs continue to provide a high level of service to the citizens that they serve. So, so once again, plan for the future. The cloud is coming. Cheaper is not better. And stay engaged and involved with NINA. It reminds me of an old saying about cost versus price. Cost is a one-time thing, but price is a lifetime thing. Just because it's cheap now doesn't mean it will be cheap, you know, over the 10 years. And that kind of leads into our next section here, too, that I want to get into, um, uh, Steve. And also, let's continue on. And it's really about now we've gone from the design of the platform. Let's talk about the power of the platform. And, and Jim, there's something else I'm going to ask you on this part, too, here. But... So there are a lot of new terms that we're introducing here. So we've talked about, you know, platform providers. There are system integrators. There are software providers. But let's get to this. How does a platform provider differ than a traditional systems integrator or software company? And now that we're talking about NextGen 911, why, in your opinion, does it need to be a platform company? Hey, Morgan, I'll, I'll take that one to start off. So yeah. pat platform providers are just that. They provide portfolio of strategic solutions that allow the public safety entities to offer solutions to meet current requirements, but position them for the next evolution of services in this fast and constant changing industry. Platform providers fully understand network designs, resiliency, you know, am I getting true diversity end to end? What about entrance and last mile diversity? How do I integrate my existing network platform with future network platforms, such as FirstNet? There's a lot of traction around FirstNet. So, Jim, um, I know that you had a couple thoughts on this, and there's some things that you wanted to talk about. So pop in, because I have a follow-up question with you that deals with this directly and with some procurement issues around complexity. But well, let's get your thoughts on this. Sure. So, um you know, the, the first thing I would say is all, all elements of the, the ecosystem are essential. So when you think about the, the, the companies that provide applications, those are essential. The companies that provide platforms are, are essential as well, but they are different. And so um, the, the, the way I look at it is uh, Uber. So um, uh, I love using Uber. Uh, I love going into a city and, and opening up my app and finding a driver and having them take me to, to, to the hotel where I need to stay. And, and so Uber is a software company. They, they've invented an application. The real platform are the cars that drive around and take you from point A to point B. And so what I really care about is the car itself and how well it, how safe it is and how well it'll get me from point A to point B. Uh, I need the app, and the app is essential, and it's enormously creative. I absolutely love it. It's so convenient. But as those two pieces working together, they are different. 
And so in the world that um, uh, Lumen operates in, where we fit into the ecosystem, if you will, is we have the infrastructure. So we have the networks, we have the data centers, we have uh, the, the not network uh, operation centers, we have the security platforms, and we actually have visibility and control directly into the infrastructure. Um, whereas, you know, another way of implementing a platform is for is for a company to maybe procure that from somebody else. And so, uh, we would just uh, advance that um, a, a platform, the platform provider, has the direct uh, access and visibility and and management of the infrastructure itself. So let me expound upon that a little bit uh, because Steve kind of set this up. You talked about it a little bit, and I can tell you in 2012, I was the senior law enforcement advisor for the Republican National Convention. First time we thought about deploying a private broadband network, which was FirstNet at that time, hadn't been named that quite yet, but we were deploying that. So much complexity, so many issues we had to deal with. And actually, this is a follow on to a question Chris Sawball had from San Diego County talking about procurement. If I asked people what the most efficient process in government was, I don't think procurement would be number one on the list. That's something we always deal with as we try and be agile, as we look at agile processes. So, Jim, can you just expand on that a little bit about why organizational experience and, and in the complexity that we're dealing with, it's so important to think about those things from a platform standpoint as opposed to a single point of integration? Yeah, you know, I, I think when you look at the the end-to-end -end of the procurement process, uh, it, it really is complex and it has a lot of parts to it and a lot of different organizations working together and handoffs and communication uh, ac across a wide spectrum. And so whenever you, uh, in any human endeavor where you have so many wide groups of individuals trying to work together, things can slow down. So I, I think one thing that can really help the process be much more efficient is if it is um, an integrated approach where all the elements fitting together are clearly defined. And, and so uh, in, instead of uh, an approach maybe where it is um, uh, one procurement for one piece of, of a solution and a different procurement for a different piece of solution and, and so on and so forth, there's efficiencies to be had. And I'll talk a little bit about this in the, the next part of our, our time this, this afternoon. There are efficiencies to be had when, when you can really look at it as a platform and, and ensure that all the integration elements are, are there. And, and so I think that, that can drive an efficiency there. I, I think also, and I'll keep coming back to this because I think it's so important, it really is a human exercise. And, and the quality of the, the, the collaboration between all players who are involved and the questions that get asked, the answers that get figured out is, is going to, I think, drive efficiency as well. So, Steve, let me go back to you for a minute um, about this around the power of the platform as we talked about what it is and designing it. In your experiences, you've been out there in the field working with the customers, you know, feet on the street, you know, right there where it's going on. What have been some of the what tend to be some of the things that get overlooked when people start thinking about projects? I mean, what tend to be like maybe the one to two to three things that tend to sneak up on folks, to your point, if you don't think about planning now, what are the unintended consequences of doing a project like this if you haven't spent the proper amount of time planning it out? Hey, Morgan, great question. And and we, we probably have this conversation on our team calls on a regular basis. It's, it's a couple of things. Number one, making sure that the network is designed to be as robust and resilient as possible. But more importantly, you know, trying to figure out how you integrate and interface with the OSPs, WSPs. Although those guys are leg those are kind of legacy terms, they play a critical part in the delivery of that 911 call to the PCM to, to some degree. Meaning that, you know, from the OSP perspective, when those wildline callers dial 911, it still has to get from the local urban centers or central offices to the cloud, to the network to get delivered to the PCAP. So we, what we found out is in a lot of these projects, the one piece that, go, that gets overlooked is how do you interface with the originating service providers to ensure that you are interfacing and taking that traffic and delivering to the PCAPs. 
Yeah, again, when we think about designing it and just the complexities, just the number of devices that are out there, I mean, the whole world has changed. Uh, this is a quick question, just based upon the platform before we get into the customer success story. I wanna ask you, uh, Steve, you and Jim this. What do you, we've had so much change, radical change, part of it because of COVID, part of it just because of the dynamics of how technology changes. How, what kind of changes do you expect to see from a platform standpoint that will be, that will blow people away? In other words, man, I never thought we could do something like this. You know, new efficiencies, new applications, uh, you know, new capabilities. So this is kind of putting your Nostradamus hat on and thinking into the future. So if we right. integrate it, we design, we understand the power, and now we've got a platform. What are some exciting things that people can look forward to based on this, you think, in the next, you know, five to seven years? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take a stab at that first, and then Steve, I, I'm really interested in hearing what you have to say as well. You know, um, you know, from for, from my point of view, th th there's so many elements that are already in place now. They just haven't all come together in the way that will really drive the most benefit for the emergency response. And, and, and so, you know, Steve touched on that a little bit already. Th there's been, um, you know, a very siloed approach to delivering solutions to public safety in the past, where uh, different applications that a public safety answer point uses could be manufactured by, by different um, software providers, could be uh, delivered by different integrators, could be uh, right across different networks. There, there's there, there's, a, there's a, 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 a siloed nature to that, but, but we know that at the end of the day, the emergency response process is integrated. It starts with somebody or something saying, I need help, flowing all the way through to that first responder and all of the teams involved in providing that help. And, and so many of those handoffs now happen manually, voice handoffs from one person to the next. There certainly is some integration, to be sure, between applications. But I think when I put my Nostradamus hat on, I really think about the future. I think about our ability as a, as a broader public safety community to really be able to harness all this data that's available, make sure it gets to the um, public safety professionals in a secure way, and then it finds its way to the right applications. Those applications are integrated together for the whole public safety experience driving efficiency and accuracy. And, and, and at the end, making sure that those who are going to be providing the help, the first responders have all the information they need to keep them safe, that to help them save and help the people that they need to help uh, and, and do it as efficiently as possible. It feels like right now, there are just so many separate islands of data and islands of technology. And in the future, the theme will be integration. Standards will help get us there. And so bodies like Nina are working on standards for data and ingestion and all those things. And those things are essential. And the vendor community, I think the application providers are rallying to, to have stories about their applications and how they work across a, a continuum of the, of the public safety emergency response. To me, that's where I think things get really excited when I, everything hooks together. But Steve, I'm curious your thoughts. Uh, uh, thank you, Jim. So I've just got a couple of points. So I think one term that we're going to start see to kind of start being used a lot in this space is the term of convergence. I know that term started many, many years ago, and that was the conversion of voice and data networks. And I think we're seeing the first phase of convergence where we're now having one network that we're utilizing to deliver Annie and Ally and other types of data to the, 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 the public safety agencies. But I think we're going to expound on that solution. And now there's one network that's going to be redundant and resilient is going to be used to carry all types of public safety solutions to the PSAP. And I, what I mean by that is no longer is there going to be a separate network for CAD. No longer is there going to be a separate network for records management systems or voice recorders. I think eventually all of that traffic will converge to a single network managed by a platform provider. The second piece I think is going to happen here in, in the next couple of years is people are going to start to adopt the cloud as a way to do business in the public safety space. 
I know right now we're still having some peace have to have some reservations about moving certain aspects of the business to the cloud. But I think over time, they're going to realize the cost effectiveness and the cost efficiencies by moving those applications to the cloud that once took up a lot of a lot of space in the back room. And I think the third piece, and I'm kind of really excited about this one, is once we truly start to implement an I3 uh, network, that we're going to start being able to see intelligent call routing. Even today, as the first phase of next year, number one, we're still using some form of Tableau or MSAG data to route that call to the appropriate net PSAP. But I think in the true I3 world, after we kind of get this convergence piece going, we're going to start to see intelligence routing become the de facto, meaning that now if a call comes in and it truly needs to go to a police entity that is routed to that agency up front without having to be answered by a call taken transfer. So I think we're going to get a lot more efficient in how we handle and process 911 calls with this converged network interfacing and integrating from a platform perspective with I3. Yeah, we'll see if it actually ends up being a true work from home. I mean, can you imagine being work from home 911? Hold on, kids, just a minute. You know, mommy's busy or daddy's <laughs> busy, so we'll see. But that's actually part of the power. Well, speaking of the power, one of the things I always want to end up with is a real success story, you know, real life. So let's take everything we've learned and let's bring it all together in a real world example. So, Jim, this one's on your shoulders here. What's an example of how this can really work? And as you're talking about this, really key upon those issues about what were some of the biggest hurdles you had to overcome to get this project uh, going. So I turn the floor over to you for the case study. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. So uh, to me, this is like, th this is the, um, this is the stuff you really need to talk about. Th this is the stuff that's exciting and because, you know, uh, and, until a solution is implemented in a particular location, until the public safety answer point, those folks working there can, can really, uh, efficiently deliver uh, emer in the emergency response um, responses and, and until lives are actually saved and property saved and first responders are made safer, then it's all theoretical. So so let me let, let me share a story of, of a, a journey that we've been on with the state of South Dakota now for, for quite a while. Uh, but, but let me open up by saying I'm going to talk about South Dakota because I think it's a great story for us to tell, use case for us to explore given what we've been talking about this afternoon, but we recognize, because we work across the country, there is no one size fits all in implementations of next generation 911. So, so every state, every jurisdiction, whether it's a county or a city is a little different, uh, but there are lessons to be learned. And so the solution that was deployed in South Dakota was a statewide uh, uh, emergency services IP network, ESINET with next gen core services, as well as a uh, call handling delivered as a managed service across all uh, 28 PSAPs plus two backups in, in the state. So the implementation was replace the ESINET, implement the ESINET, and implement call handling as a managed services. And, and this was all implemented in um, in eight months. And, and so, and, and I wanna pause there for just a second, and then I'll, I'll kind of provide some details here. I, I think everybody involved was was proud of the execution of the implementation. The, the, there was some very there was some very um, um, uh, important date milestones to hit on that implementation for the state, um, but it wasn't about racing to the finish line. It was about quality, and it was about implementing a solution that saved lives. And so that was always the primary uh, objective. Uh, but but there were. Um, expectations that we all had of each other to, to implement it in an efficient way, and we were able to do that. Um, I have to tell you that when, when we talk about thinking about the platform, it's not just a technology conversation. It's also a people conversation because the technology tends to get a lot of the attention, but the people element of it is so important as well. So, so in, um, in South Dakota, there, there is strong statewide leadership in, in 911. And, and, and that's important because the, the guidance for the strategy on deploying a new ESINET in the state, the guidance to um, uh, implement a call handling solution across the state in a managed services model 
and, and really gathering all the counties together to, to be of one like mind on that strategy what was under the leadership of Maria King in, in the state. And so Maria really set the stage with, with her team, all the folks that she worked with, the counties that she worked with, she really set the stage to enable us to be able to implement in such an efficient way and then go from there, which is really the platform story is how you bridge into the future. And so Maria's leadership was uh, essential. So, so as I mentioned, the, the implementation timeframe was very aggressive and, and this uh, was already complicated. So a lot of moving parts to it, but anytime you take something complicated and, and you try to do it as quickly as you can, then it becomes even more complicated. And, and so, um, uh, but that is a reality that the team, all of us working together, um, wrestled with and, and quite successfully. And the thing that I think is important to note is from the very beginning, this is before any implementation started, Maria and team were already asking questions about the future. It, it's like I said, you really don't want to launch into building your platform without having a sense of where you're going. And so there were questions asked about text to 911, about upgrading the call handling application to, to new solutions going forward or new functionality going forward, um, uh, have, ensuring that the platform was going to be uh, in a, able to ingest new forms of data like telematics and things like that. So, so all those kinds of questions, but not all the questions that needed to be asked, were being asked at, at the very beginning. And, and, and this is really important. And, and the other thing that I that I would like to highlight that's really important is the state's commitment to ensuring that a public safety grade platform be in place. And so taking really important moves around diverse uh, facilities into the local PSAPs, whether it's across multiple carriers or, or different access paths, recognizing that to have a public safety grade platform requires that level of, of, of diligence and, and commitment to, to ensuring that the infrastructure is in place. And I think, you know, from my point of view, the real success is the feedback from the PSAP. So, you know, Maria tells the stories of as the, the new solution, the new call handling solution was deployed into the PSAPs as immediate positive feedback that the experiences that they were going to be having we're, we're going to be improved. And, and of course, as the experience in a PSAP is improved, then, then lives are being saved. And, that, and that's, what it's, that's what it's all about. And so, so I think it's important to note that the platform that was deployed in South Dakota was deployed with the future in mind. So it wasn't just a point in time of doing one thing. It was with the, the future in mind. And, and so, so I think that's uh, really important for us to, to, to remember. Of course, it wasn't easy. There were, there were obstacles and hurdles to get over. Organization was one of them. Having a strong project plan that really linked all the elements together, tight communication between all the players involved. And we, got, we had up to 100 people working on this at one time uh, through the duration of the project. So keeping that all organized was essential. But it was all organized around the platform story, which provided that cohesive definition of what we were going to do, not only in the ESINET, but also in the call handling platform. And, and the, the last thing I want to say here is, um, you know, just to, just to touch on kind of why, why was this successful? And, and I think, you know, the, the technology got delivered and, and we went through a, a lot of work as a team to make sure the right technology was in place and, and everything worked as well. But I really have to say that the, the fundamental reason why this worked was the people involved. You know, it was Maria King and her leadership and really setting the stage and really being a strong partner throughout the whole process, continuing to be such a strong partner, her leadership in the state. And, and also Monica Smith, who is a Lumen employee who was our project manager in South Dakota. And the thing I loved about talking to these two individuals is you know, Maria's emphasis in that never forgetting that this is all about saving lives. And, and, and that just really struck a, a chord with me. And then Monica's comment that perfection is the requirement. That, that was her motto. And it really um, uh, exemplified in how the, the project was run. So, so back, back to you, Morgan. Uh, I love great stories like this because um, it just, 
you know, as a taxpayer, I like to see my money being spent well. But as a pro somebody used to be in the profession, I'm so excited to see the advancement of this technology. So, look, what we wanted to do is close this out today by, number one, thanking everybody who attended. If you're involved in public safety, I want I personally want to thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart, because having come from that, having had friends who served in that, losing friends in the line of duty, I know how important and critical your jobs are out there. And to me, there is nothing more important, as Jim and Steve both said, it all starts with the call. It all starts with 911. And I'm selfish. I want to make sure my government, my public safety agency has the best technology available. And we can't deliver these kind of solutions and these kind of webinars without the great help of our corporate sponsors like Lumen. So my personal thanks to uh, Jim and Steve for being on this. Also, I want to make sure we thank Courtney. She was behind the scenes. You folks didn't see her, but she did a lot of help to help bring this together. And we want to thank you folks for being on this. We're going to finish right now at the top of the hour. We want to say thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you on another government technology webinar. Any issues, there's a follow-up. You will get an email with the webinar, the link to it, the recorded one. Download the slides, leave us your survey, and everybody out there, stay safe. We'll see you again on another webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.